And, <laughs> and I told him, I said, Uncle Ron, I think it was about 45 minutes, um, maybe an hour. He said, come on, man, you can't speak that long. <laughs> and so the next time I got ready to speak, I believe it was a, a Wednesday night this time, and Miss June might can help me remember, but it was a Wednesday night, and I was going to speak on prayer, and I had this thing, and I was like, Uncle Earl said, don't speak long, don't speak long, keep people's <laughs> attention. That night, on a Wednesday night, church started at 7 o'clock. I'm pretty sure we were wrapped up and driving home at 7.06. Um, I, think, I think I spoke for maybe five minutes max. And um, I remember I called Uncle Earl. I said, I kept it short. I kept it short. And I told him how long I spoke. And he's like, come on, man, <laughs> again. And I was like, ah. But he told me again how proud he was of me and, and that, um, that I did a good job. And like I said, as Uncle Earl always told me keep it short and sweet so with that I know Uncle Earl will be restless at this point of my of my speech so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna wrap it up a couple closing thoughts I believe Uncle Earl would want all of you to remember that you are loved no matter what you've done in life the love and blood of Christ is sufficient and I believe that Uncle Earl lived his life to show and share that message with as many people as possible. Uncle Earl lived his life in such a way that he could say, just as Paul did in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Uncle Earl shared Matthew 25, 23 many times. I heard him say it many, many times. And it's, it reads, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Uncle Earl is sharing the joy in the presence of Jesus. Uncle Earl... <coughs> did not die on Wednesday morning. He just finally got promoted to live. Thank you.
Let me begin by just saying it ain't fair. It just ain't fair. Why would God give a man such an ability to preach and play the piano at the same time? All us other preachers are just jealous as we could be uh, of him. And I just want you to know a dual talent like that, it just ain't fair. Uh, Earl loved to play, and I'd love to sing with him, but you don't need to sing with that. That's got words and music at the same time. But I would tell people the highlight of my singing career is I did get to sing with the Easters one time. It was only because it was at my church, and they was taking up the offer, and I was on stage anyway. Uh, <laughs> the other probably highlight is Earl actually has uh, from years back a song that uh, myself and Irish Riddle and Dr. Al Brian Ellenberg played the trumpet. Uh, we, we did a song, Oh Holy Night, and he put that on his Facebook page, and he's a connoisseur of music, and I thought, man, I didn't hit the big world now. Uh, Earl Hartley has pa played, uh, pasted me singing uh, on his Facebook page. You know, I learned a long time ago that Earl loved music, and he invited me uh, to Southside Baptist Church back in 2011, May of 2011, uh, to preach revival. And I'll pre never forget that Tuesday night we sang, When we all get to heaven, when the roll is called up yonder, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Then I got behind the pulpit and preached about the subject we all ignore, hell. <laughs> and uh, Earl got a big kick out of that. He said, we sang about heaven, and then you turned around and you preached about hell. Well, this morning as we come to this place our eyes are filled with tears there's a lump in our throats our hearts feel like they're shattered into a thousand pieces and we come to this place a place where Earl has stood many times and where he's played many times to comfort many families and we've come here though to to celebrate his life uh, I'm thankful that as Christians we sorrow but we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope uh, today we celebrate victory over death and the grave you know, we use the cross many times as a symbol of our faith. But the first century church used the empty tomb as a symbol of their faith. And today, we're celebrating that that earthly tabernacle that we come to love so well, laying in that casket is not Earl Hartley. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, that earthly tabernacle is going to be laid in the ground. And on resurrection day, it's going to ascend into heaven, be reunited with his soul, and forever, the Bible says, that we will be with the Lord. Now, as we come here today to celebrate life, I'm not saying that we're not sad, because I surely know I am. I'm not going to say we're not hurting, Miss Mary, because I know I am. I'm not even going to say our grief is not heavy, because it is. But despite our sadness, and despite our grief, and despite our pain, we celebrate victory that Jesus has made possible over death and the grave. And Miss Mary, God waited until you were 30 to send you a husband. And although you might have had to wait for a while, he surely sent you a very special man to share life together with. And I know that with such a great love comes a great pain at separation. Uh, for Earl's family, I would want you to know that I know that you are all important to Earl. And he loves his family very much. And he's thankful for those memories. And Parker, thank you for sharing I think Earl would have been very proud. Now, we're very thankful for that story you told us about the window, but he might have told you to leave that one out. Uh, but, uh, but we're very thankful that, that you included that today. For many of the friends that are here today, and I see folks from churches all around, uh, for friends today, Earl is no longer preaching and praying and playing the piano. He's no longer leading and serving. But I believe that he is, according to Hebrews chapter 12, a part of that great cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on as we pick up the mantle and we continue to serve. And I hope that we'll do it the way that Earl did it. Earl lived his life with love, uh, with sacrifice, with integrity, with humility, with kindness, with meekness, with generosity, and with diligence in everything that he did. And you know something that I've noticed is I have seen individuals, and one that I've been able to watch very closely is Jeremy, as I have seen individuals that Earl has made a great, great impact on and mentored, I have seen those same characteristics in their life. And those are some of the things that I love about those men that Earl has mentored through the years. Earl was faithful to God first and foremost. And I believe because he was faithful to God that that's why he could be faithful to Miss Mary. Faithful to his family. Faithful 
to his friends and to so many others. I would just like to tell those of us who are here as friends today that I'm thankful that you've come. I'm sure that like me, your world has kind of felt shattered and rocked the last couple of days and we've kind of wondered what can we do and many of us have rushed to Miss Mary's side. But you know, there's a tendency for us to go back to business as usual. There's a tendency for us this afternoon just to kind of fall back into our groove. Uh, but for this family, but particularly for Miss Mary, her life's going to be different from this point forward. And I would say this, you love her and Mr. Earl enough to be here today. So call her tomorrow. Call her next week. Call her in two weeks, in a month, in six months. Because grief is not an event. Grief is a journey. And it's a journey that she's going to walk the rest of her life. And I have pledged to her that I'm here for her and I'm going to check on her. But, but, but let's all make sure, as Earl cared for so many people through the years, let's now be faithful to Miss Mary. And I believe that's one way that we can honor his life. I met Earl over 20 years ago, and I just knew him as a pastor in the halls of the hospital. I love preachers. I walk up to him all the time, and I say, hey, preacher, how you doing today? And, and carry on a conversation. And then 18 years ago, God called me to the Lakelands Association, and we became friends. But probably a little over 12 years ago, David Little paired some pastors up together and told us to go have lunch together and get to know each other. And Earl and I had lunch together one day, and I found out that day he's a little bit gullible. I'd try to pick him a little bit, and he'd say, come on, man, because he, he took everything I said serious, and you can't take most of what I say serious unless I'm behind the pulpit. And, uh, but anyway, we went on, and I remember that, and I also remember ordering, and he said, you go eat all that? And uh, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to eat all that, Earl. I probably outweigh you 50 pounds. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat every, every bit of that. But that day, we just struck up a relationship to where we became prayer partners, and uh, he and I could, could pray for things over the years, and Earl has, uh, for that period of time, been on my prayer list. Every Monday, I pray for uh, pastors that are great friends of mine and, and ministry leaders. And, and I told Miss Mary the other day that, that she's on that list. And I really never have paid any attention to the fact that when I wrote down Earl's name, I wrote down Mary's name because it's almost like they just went together. And I just assume when I was typing it out, it's on my phone, comes up every Monday morning. It says Earl and Mary. And, and y'all, they're part of what I pray for. And I don't think I did that intentionally other than the fact that when I think about one of you, I think about the other. It's like I don't use peanut butter without jelly. You know, and the, the two just go together. And when I think about uh, the two of you, I, I think about you that way. You know, there are three types of people that we all need in our life. Uh, we all need a Paul. We all need a Barnabas. And we all need a Timothy. And I know that uh, Earl was a learner. He really was. He stood behind the pulpit and preaching. A lot of folks might assume that guys just stand there open up the Bible and they say things, but no. Uh, to speak for God, you first, first have to hear from God. And he was very diligent in his studies. Uh, he's also very diligent in practicing the piano. Uh, even their male person heard them play all the time and one time thought Miss Mary was the one doing it. I told Miss Mary, I would have to took the credit for it. Uh, you know, if somebody came to me and said, I thought that was you, I would have said, that was me. I coach Earl up all the time, you know. But, uh, but, but neighbors heard them playing and always thought it was Miss Mary, but it was Earl. But if he was going to play the piano, he practiced. If he was going to preach, he studied. He was very much a learner, and I'm sure earlier in his life, in the 60s and 70s and even, even the 80s, there were, there, there were some Pauls that were pouring deeply into him. And through the years, Earl became a Paul. He became that man, no telling how many uh, prayers he prayed and, and how many Bible studies and devotions he shared throughout South Carolina and North Carolina, how many sermons he preached, how many times somebody was being urged by the Holy Spirit and Earl led them to understand how to be reconciled to God through Jesus. The number of people he baptized, the weddings he officiated, and how many funerals he stood and just gave scriptural truths and comfort. To the family. But you know, I knew Earl as a Barnabas. Earl was an encourager to me. Earl was one of the very few people. Uh, you can count on one hand and have some fingers left over. How many people I will really share my heart with? How many people I'll really let know the struggles in my life? But Earl was one of those men. He was one of those men that I could stand before and let him know that my feet were made out of clay, that I wasn't perfect. Parker said that sometimes as pastors we present an image in front of people, and we do. And sometimes we aren't as transparent as we could be because we can see that as a weakness. But Earl was a man that I could share 
my struggles. And I believe that I was one that he could share that with as well. You know, sometimes folks believe that preachers wear a Superman cape under their clothing. Uh, but Earl and I understood that we were just two ordinary men striving to follow a divine calling. Always know that that's what a pastor is. He's just an ordinary man trying to follow a divine calling. You know, as I think about Earl, he was about as organized as a person that I've ever met. <laughs> a very conscientious pastor. You know, I don't think I ever saw Earl where he wasn't dressed sharply. Uh, Miss Mary, when I came to your house yesterday, I was wearing blue jeans, but almost changed because I thought, I bet Earl would never wear blue jeans. <laughs> never saw him with his hair messed up. I didn't have nerve to do it, but I wanted to reach over a table a couple times and just... <laughs> Just mess it up one time to see what it looked like, but I never saw that. I never even saw his car dirty. Uh, you know, everything that he had was, was always clean. And then I realized yesterday that he even decorated his and Miss Mary's beautiful home. He's the one that put everything in place uh, all the time. He liked everything neat, and he liked everything in place. Uh, several years ago at an associational Christmas dinner, Earl told Cindy and I about a Christmas tree y'all have. And Miss Mary was telling me about that yesterday. And then... She said, you know, for all the things that people gave us through the years, and I know as a pastor how many things you get through the years, Earl always wrote each of those gifts down. And she brought out a legal pad, very neatly handwritten, by the way. Pages is in, upon pages, going back into the 1970s, of all the things that people had given them. That shows the conscientiousness that Earl lived his life with. That's why he's a beloved pastor in two states. That's why he's that guy that people keep calling back for homecoming. That's the guy that, that's why when, when, when pastors are out, they wanted Earl to fill in for them uh, because he was just a good man in and through. Anybody can carry the title pastor or preacher, but not everybody wears that title well. But Earl wore that title well. When I saw those pages and pages in, in Earl's neat handwriting, it, it helped me understand a little bit about why, why he is so loved. I know when he would preach for me, he preached one Sunday night several years ago, and I got back, and always preachers won't know how things went. I said, how'd it go? And what I was told was, preacher, you don't take enough time off. You know, you, 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 need, to, you need to be gone just a little bit more and, and tell Earl he can come and play and he can come and preach at this church any time uh, that you want him to. He was a beloved pastor and preacher and a pianist, but I'll tell you this, Earl loved to play the piano, he did. But his heart was to share the gospel. His heart was to preach the word. If he wanted to be known for anything, he wanted to be known as one who brought the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for people to hear. You know, many of us have a life verse, and if you've ever received, uh, I think he used to call some notes he wrote, Earl's Pearls, or a handwritten note from Earl. Uh, many times he would include the Bible verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. The Amplified Bible would say it this way, and we know with great, or we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. You know, what we have to realize is Although God says that all things will work together for the good, God's definition of good and our definition of good sometimes is not the same. God's definition of good is anything that brings us closer to Him. Anything that helps us to know Him better and love Him more. Anything that helps us to become a better tool in His hand. Our definition of good sometimes is ease and comfort and success and healing and, and provision. But Earl understood that God works all things for His good. And you know, today I, I think that Earl would, he would know and he would want us to know that, that even death is good. The Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. While we would have preferred to be called up in the rapture together with Earl, that's how we would have wanted to write it down. God's plan for removing us from the world is good because this world's condemned by sin. God doesn't want us to have to live here forever. And right now he's rescuing us one by one and taking us to the place that he has prepared for us. Earl has been shepherded into God's presence. And as much as he loves us, he wouldn't come back to us today, but he sure would have the desire that we go and be where he is. Earl even knew that grief is good. The Bible says, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The psalmist says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. 
And in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me, even when yet there was none of them. And I know some of you would think, well, how in the world could grief be good? But you think about this with me. If we did not have our loved ones like Earl going to heaven, how many of us would love this world too much? You see, today I have one more reason to look forward to going to heaven myself. I have one more reason to, to earnestly long to be in God's presence. And even our grief is good because our grief helps us to let go of this world and to desire what God has always intended for us. Earl knew that sickness and suffering were good. Matthew wrote, Come to me, in Jesus' words, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know, when life gets hard is when we turn to God the most, do we not? And it's in, those, it's in those experiences that we would never have asked for, those experiences that we would avoid, avoid with all costs. It's in those times that we see the grace of God in the way we've never seen it, the love of God in the way we've never experienced it. And God begins to mold and shape us in the vessels that he can use for his glory. You know, as I knew Earl, and I don't know how many people he shared this with, but I know when he faced that open heart surgery, that was a time that he was really afraid. So it was a very difficult time, and I fully understand that. And I remember he and I having those conversations, and he telling me how, how difficult it was. But you know, as I watched his life after that, I believe that through that experience, he became a better preacher, a better pastor. And I believe that through that experience and other many painful times that God saw you all through, that, that God drew him even closer, and he became an even greater instrument for God to use. You know, I'm confident today that Earl, while he believed this by faith, while he was here, he seen with his own eyes what Paul wrote in Romans 8, 18, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. Today, Earl is enjoying God's rest. And today, God is, Earl is anticipating those times where he will receive his reward, his Crowns. You know, the scripture says that there are at least five crowns. Some people may could find more, but I can find five crowns that are listed in the Bible. And Earl is one of probably only three people that I have been able to, to share in their funeral service that I believe could very well be in the running for all five of these crowns. The Bible talks about a crown of life, and that's for those who pr pr face trouble and hardship while serving God. Listen, if you're a Baptist preacher for 40 years, you've been put through the ringer more than one time. I guarantee you that. And then there's the crown of righteousness. And that's for those who look forward to his appearing, and Earl did. Earl lived with that maybe today mentality. And then there's the incorruptible crown, or maybe in some uh, translations it's called the imperishable crown. And that's for those who live their life by God's commands, those who live a holy life. And, I mean, Earl was not perfect. He's like all of us, sinner in need of a Savior. You know, we never get to the place that we're sinless. But as we mature, we should sin less. And I think that's where Earl was. He had learned to, with God's help, sin less uh, in life. And so uh, I believe that incorruptible or imperishable crown. And then the, the crown of rejoicing, and that's the soul winner's crown. And of all the things, Earl loved to play music, he loved to have fun, he loved to go places, but there was nothing that brought Earl Hartley greater joy than to see a lost sinner pray to receive Jesus Christ as his or her Lord and Savior. He desired that more than anything else. And then the crown of glory. The crown of glory is for pastors or maybe extensions of the pastoral ministry and deacons and elders, uh, those who have served as under-shepherds to the great shepherd. And I believe in my mind, I'm not God and I'm not the one to decide. But if I had to decide, I believe that Earl would be worthy of all of those. But just in case some of you would wonder, man, five crowns would be sure a whole lot for Earl to have to turn around in heaven. We don't have to worry about that. According to Revelation 4 and verse 10, the 24 elders laid their crowns at Jesus' feet. And I believe that we'll do the same. I believe we'll have an opportunity to go by and whatever we receive at the judgment seat of Christ, we'll lay at his feet and we'll say thank you for what you've done. For us, you know, Earl preached for nearly 50 years, and I want to want you to know today that the promises that we've shared for Earl, uh, that he's in heaven today, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, uh, those are not promises because he was a preacher. 
Those weren't promises because he was a good man. Those promises are true because he realized that he was a sinner in need of a Savior. And he repented of his sin. He received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And then he did submit his life to God's calling. So what I would want you to know today is none of us are going to get to heaven on our own righteousness. None of us get to heaven because we knew Earl or because we were baptized by him or a member of his church. If we want to see Earl again today, we'll get to heaven the same way he did. By recognizing that we're all sinners. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Bible says that God demonstrates his love in this way. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'll promise you this. There's nothing in your life or my life that Jesus hadn't already died for and you can't be forgiven of. And what we can do to prepare for this day ourselves is we can recognize that we're a sinner, ask God to forgive us of our sin, repent of that sin, turn to God, ask Jesus to be our Savior, submit our life to his control and authority, and then we, like Earl, can be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I believe sometime Saturday night, a scene that looked something like this took place. I believe Earl stood before God and he heard something like this. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have fought the good fight. You have finished the race. You have kept the faith. Enter my rest. For the child of God to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Miss Mary family, we ask ourselves after this service, where, how do we go on? What do we do? One of the things you do is hold on to those good memories. Hold on to those good memories. They have such healing power. Lean on God through the unlived tomorrows. Lean on Him. I unapologetically need to lean on Him. I, without Him, I could not face tomorrow. So you lean on Him. Grieve together. Two are better than one. And a three-chord strand is not easily broken. It is both dumb and dangerous to grieve alone. So when you find yourself in a time of grief, sometimes we just need to go have a walk. Sometimes we need to be by ourselves. But if you find yourself pulling away, call somebody. Call me. Call somebody else here that will talk with you and help you through that time. You know, don't force yourself to get over this loss. We're all different. God made us different. Some are tall, some are short. We, we have a lot of different qualities, and, and you may or may not understand this, but you know we all grieve differently. Some folks can accomplish in one month what other, others need six months to accomplish. So we don't have to grieve according to somebody else's pattern. You grieve according to your heart and how God made you. And then I would tell all of us, make sure you walk with the Lord. There is no other way. There is no other way. Make sure that you walk with the Lord and hold on to the hope that Earl is alive today and that we will see him again. And then let's do what Earl did. As long as we have breath, let's work for the Lord. You know, he preached this past Sunday. Uh, he was faithful to the Lord all the way to the end. You know, the Bible says, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and broad is the path that leads to destruction. There are a lot more people around us that are going to spend a Christless eternity than folks that have the hope that we've talked about today. And I believe that we ought to pick up the mantle that Earl had and we ought to to, to have a heart to share the gospel with those that are lost. And then I hope that you, like me, find some comfort in the fact that Earl is at rest in heaven today.
Amen. You know, every time Earl heard you sing that song, he would always share with me when we talked, oh man, Brother George did a great job. He loved hearing you sing that, and so today he got to hear it from heaven. What about that? Sitting there in all God's glory, being there in the throne room of heaven with all of those who went on before him. I just want to say what a privilege it is just to be able to have uh, just a few minutes here with the closing prayer. But uh, as many, I am like many of you and, and agree with everything that's already been said. Brother Earl was just a treasure to be uh, in your life. He was such a tremendous friend and an encourager. And um, we are so blessed uh, because of the friendships that we have. There was a passage of scripture that I had thought about that I wanted to share in Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. And I want to just say today, even in this moment, we have been so blessed by Earl and the gift and the many works that the Lord had given him to be able to play his own funeral. Uh, what a tremendous gift that is and what a tremendous talent he has and what a blessing he is still in our lives. And uh, we are just so thankful uh, to be able to uh, experience uh, his wonderful talents and his gifts. And uh, Miss Mary, we are continually praying for you. And I know that um, uh, many times when I would talk with Earl and uh, over the course of 20 years, we had a tremendous mentorship and uh, I often think of myself as young Timothy sitting under Paul, you know, as we had that kind of relationship. Many things he would uh, caution me against and many things I would run by him. And uh, he would say, you may want to rethink that, Jeremy. And I was thinking uh, I would send him different things, too, about how to word stuff. And he would encourage me. And, and uh, sometimes he wouldn't even just mark mine. He'd just throw it on out the window and say, you need to start over, brother. This is terrible. <laughs> so... Uh, we had a tremendous blessing, but uh, Earl was there when I was ordained and ordained my brother and my father into the deacon ministry. It's just a tremendous treasure that he has been to, to my life. And uh, what a tremendous blessing it is to know that uh, all the many labors he did for the Lord, he is now finding rest, rest for his soul. And I know that is his prayer for all of us. So at this time, let's have our closing prayer. Father, we are grateful today for the gift that you've given us in the life of Earl Hartley. We are grateful today for his love, for his encouragement, for his example, for his faithfulness to you. And we are most thankful today that he at some point in his life realized that he needed Jesus. And that this day is much different because we know that we do not have to live as those who have no hope. But because of Jesus Christ, we can live in hopes of the resurrection. We can live because we know Brother Earl and his life and his legacy, his faith, the many times he proclaimed the good news of the gospel, and the many times he testified to me and countless others of his faith and trust in the Lord. Many times he would mention to me, Jeremy, I just want to glorify the Lord. And Lord, we know that we can truly, truly celebrate all the wonderful ways that you allowed him to minister to countless amounts of people because of that one desire to just glorify the Lord. Father, I'm thankful today that he is indeed finding that rest from all of his labors. And I'm thankful that even today, on a day like today, we can still testify to the scripture that his works will follow him. And what a blessing he's been to us today, even through his music. And Father, I pray over Miss Mary. I pray for the family. I pray that you would strengthen them and comfort them in the days and weeks and months to come. Would you wrap your arms of love around them? And Father, the word says in Psalm 46, verse 1, that you are our refuge and strength. You are a very present help in times of uncertainty. And Father, I pray that this family and all of those who are here would always remember that in the midst of uncertainties, Lord, you're the place that we need to run to. You're the place that, that is safe. That's a refuge for our soul. So give us the courage. Give us the strength to do that. Father, again, we thank you and we praise you for, the, for, the, for just the, the moment to celebrate the true gift that you've given us in Brother Earl. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.